thank you for inviting me i am requested to talk on the topic of internationalization in the context of the new education policy nep 2020 that is what i'll try to do friends it is very important to see that the new education policy for the first time talks about uh, internationalization as an important agenda item in the higher education development the 1968 policy and the 1986 policy, these two policies did not talk about internationalization. This is perhaps one of the first policies that talked about internationalization of education. It also reflects a changing context of India, its uh, level of development and its aspiration to play a lead role globally. These are some of the important dimensions that should be kept in mind while discussing about internationalization of higher education. There is, there is a distinction to be made between what we want to do, whether we want to internationalize Indian education or we want to internationalize higher education in India. These are two different things. While talking about internationalization of Indian education, at times it happens that some of the courses or some of the Indian study programs are introduced in some of the universities abroad. But that does not add to the curriculum changes within India. When we talk about internationalization of higher education in India, we feel that it is more related to the changes that we want to introduce in curriculum and in the orientation. Today, the university graduates or higher education graduates are looking for employment anywhere in the world. Therefore, the skills which are developed, the dexterities which are pruned, and also the competencies that are evolved or acquired during the process should have an international market value. And that is very important when we try to talk about the changes in higher education. First, let me make a distinction between internationalization and globalization. Internationalization is a process by which international intercultural values are inculcated into every study programs. Or in other words, the orientation is to produce a global citizen with the skills which can be traded, used, relied on for the global market. However, globalization is a process which is more related to the changes in the market, the employment orientation, the skill requirements, and therefore it is a market mediated process. Internationalization is a much broader term, Whereas globalization is a subset of the internationalization process that we are talking about. In the context of internationalization, especially from the 1990s, there are four forms in which cross-border mobility takes place. But I should say that internationalization does not mean or should not be confined to this cross-border mobility. Cross-border mobility of students accounts for only 2% of the students globally, 98% of the students do not move from their country, do not move from the country of origin and the institutions. Therefore, when we talk about internationalization, we cannot confine ourselves to cross-border mobility. But however, let me today focus more on cross-border mobility, that in the context of internationalization, there are two terms which are used. One is internationalization at home, the other one is that internationalization abroad. Internationalization at home means that it implies those students who are not moving out of the country. So when we talk about internationalization abroad, it comes closer to the cross-border mobility of students, institutions, etc. So therefore, let me confine myself to cross-border mobility aspects of internationalization or globalization. There are four forms of mobility that we talk about in the context of globalization. These four forms of mobility are the programs move, the students move, the teachers move and the institutions move. 
and if you see this chronologically traditionally mobility of students used to be the major form of cross border mobility study abroad programs were the most common factors that influence the cross border mobility and you will find that in most of the colonial countries initial flow was to the imperial powers you know the countries which were ruling the colonies most of the countries for example in india the flow was more to uk to start with initially and you will also find that this is the case with uh, many other colonies so there was used to be a cross border mobility that used to take place of the students but this mobility was based on fellowships offered either by the foreign governments or by the national governments and as a result of that the number of students who could cross borders was rather limited this trend has changed over a period of time today a major share of the students are going abroad for studies from india relying on the budgets or relying on the finances of the households or in other words the public funding has replaced by household financing for internationalization and the, in the process of globalization and the study abroad programs teachers used to move earlier and even now and teachers are also valued indian teachers are also valued very high held in high esteem in many of the prestigious universities abroad now however institutional mobility was not part of this cross border mobility for for a fairly long period of time institutional mobility took place what we find mostly in the recent years and especially institutional mobility is a new trend in internationalization of higher education in the context of globalization that we find in this century you find that institutions are moving from one country to the other there are two forms in which institutional mobility takes place one is the notion of branch campuses you will find that whether it is in malaysia or singapore or doha or uh, dubai you will find large number of foreign universities starting their branch campuses this is one form in which this change takes place institutions move and institutional mobility is facilitated you get the same degree from the same university and perhaps you need don't have to go to the developed countries of uk usa or australia you get at a cheaper rate you go to dubai or any of these places where you find that it is much easier to get the degree and also pay perhaps one third or one fourth or half of the amount that you would have otherwise paid for the same degree from the same university so this is a new invention of this century you find that a substantial number of students from the developing countries are now going to the branch campuses the third or the or the other dimension which is very recent in the past decade if institution mobility took place during the first decade of this century the program mobility that we talk about uh, in, in very commonly in india and abroad has taken place or that became an important dimension of internationalization in the past decade of this century that means be, during the period between 2010 and 2020 what we find is that many online programs have come into existence india also started several online programs so many online programs came into existence so program mobility became one of the dimensions of cross border mobility and i think it is the st john's university in chicago was the first fully online accredited university in the world perhaps that is what my memory tells me friends these are the four forms in which mobility takes place now let me talk about some of the characteristics of this mobility where do indian students go most of the indian students go to usa uk canada australia etc and till recently australia was not a major player it used to be uk and usa or usa and uk in that order 
but australia became an important player attracting a large number of students uh, in the past decades you find that canada is increasingly becoming an important destination for indian students you know these are the places to which indian students are going if you are talking about institutional mobility india did not permit foreign institutions to come and establish branch campuses in india i'll come to this because the new education policy changes this provision and encourages the process of foreign universities to establish branch campuses in india i'll come to this point at a later stage if you look at the student mobility pattern i will say that there are two pathways of student mobility taking place from india one pathway is that high cost high return pathway that means the students who are going to usa uk or australia in that order they spend a lot of money or invest heavy amount of money for their education in these countries but when they return or when they work in their own, in these countries the host countries they earn higher salaries and the returns are also very high actually the visa facilities have been highly influencing the choice of the country for example usa has provisions for entertaining and retaining indian graduates for a fairly long period of time after the studies uk tried to change this in 2010 11 and suddenly we found that when the post study visa facilities have declined you will find that there is a sudden drop in the indian students going to uk for studies in the past 2 years uk has reversed this visa rule and what we find is that there is a rush to uk these trends are getting reversed or in other words it is estimated that in 2019 20 there was an increase of 93% of indian students going to uk and in australia too you find that during the period of 2010 11 there was a change in the post study visa rules and as a result of that the students started changing their destination and there was a decline in the number of indian students to go into australia but they also reversed or they also changed the visa rules permit indian students to stay longer and look for jobs you know this certainly was or is an important dimension that you find if you look at the canadian situation you will find that the visa rules are more relaxed and you will find a large number of indian students are going to canada especially in the recent past so in other words there is one path that we find which is high cost and high returns path and that is mostly the path that is adopted by better off students from the, uh, students from the better off families with rich parents who can afford to have education because a bank uh, loan will not try help to support or to cover the full cost of education either in uk or in usa so therefore they rely on family income to Uh, top up or to compensate for what is not paid by the bank or some of the families they send their children without relying on bank loans you know the other uh, part of the foreign student mobility is that low cost low return mobility you find that the students going to many countries especially for medical education in china in russia russian federation or in ukraine are mostly the students who cannot afford to go to many of these countries developed countries where the fee levels are very high cost of living is very high and they cannot afford to that so they go to these countries and especially you may notice that during this ukrainian crisis period it is estimated that there are 18000 indian students in ukraine most of them following studies in health sciences especially medical sciences and these are the people who are going to china russian federation ukraine and similar countries 
we are low cost low return pathway that i can talk about it because these students when they come back there is a difficulty their degrees are not recognized in india and they had to qualify for an examination whereby they will be given license to they will be given license to practice in india and the pass percentages some of the experiences shows that the pass percentages are very limited whereas in the low cost low return pattern mobility pathways one does not like to stay back they go for a degree get the degree and they would like to come back to india and try to pass the medical examination and try to continue the practice in india so it's a difference that you find in terms of this mobility pattern the second dimension related to student mobility is related to the students coming to india you find that india is not attracting students from the developed countries the students coming to india are mostly from the developing countries especially from south asian countries led by nepal and also some of the countries from africa and why these students are coming to india there are one or two advantages first the cost is very low secondly the institutions higher education institutions in india are considered to be prestigious or better of more credible than the institutions higher education institutions in the countries from where they are coming so this is one of an attractive attraction point for african students and also for nepali students india is in the process of encouraging larger number of students to come to india india is in the process of providing fellowships for students from many countries to come to india and study in india a ma large ma majority of the students coming for studies in india from abroad study in karnataka in andhra pradesh and in maharashtra because of the areas of specialization that they are choosing you know so this is another pattern but i should say that although as i mentioned in the beginning trade in education under the gats framework in the context of globalization education has become a trade trading commodity for trade this is not the case when we consider the students who are coming to india when we consider the students who are uh, coming to india to have higher learning opportunities and facilities they are coming to india for get, getting a degree from a university which is more prestigious than the universities that they have in their home secondly also they feel that if they study in india there are opportunities to go outside to some other country especially developed country for further higher studies that opportunities or that facilities will be better you know so it is important to notice that it is more of a more of more to encourage enrich the diplomatic relations and it is part of perhaps india's diplomacy that we find in providing fellowships and attracting larger number of students to india the another category or the change that we are talking about today especially in the context of new education policy is the starting of branch campuses india never permitted a branch campus institutions or foreign institutions to start the branch campuses but the new policy stipulates that recommends that any university which is within the 100 of the global ranking top 100 positions in the global ranking can come and start their branch campuses this is a dramatic change in the policy and dramatic change in our uh, attitude towards internationalization of higher education however the details needs to be worked out what does it mean in terms of repatriation of profit what does it mean in terms of admission policies how this change in the policy will be affected by will be influenced by the changes in other sectors both in employment and also in terms of payment of fees say for example it is estimated that we had at nipa conducted a survey a quick survey among the top 200 institutions in the world to indicate their willingness to come 
what we find is that some institutions are interested but majority of the institutions are not keen to start branch campuses in India. It may be partly because of the reason that when Indian students are ready to pay fees and go to these countries or migrate to these countries for studies first and later for employment, they, why should they come and start branch campuses in India? This may be one of some of the reasons for that. But I am not in a position to uh, detail out further information on this because we do not have that information. I think this dimension of bringing foreign institutions to India dramatically changes the role of uh, internationalization in the context of Indian higher education. There are institutions which promote internationalization in India. There are many universities, especially the private universities and some of the public universities attract a large number of foreign students to India. And I should say that this flow of students from other countries to India is not based on a purely commercial basis, although the private institutions charge heavy fees, but in the public institutions, the fee levied is very minimal and living expenditure or living cost of the students in India is also very low. So this is basically what one finds in the context of internationalization. To sum up, I will say that internationalization needs to be distinguished from globalization. Internationalization is a broader term, whereas globalization is a market mediated subset of internationalization. And what one finds is also that internationalization can be at home or abroad. And a majority of the students do not cross borders for education. Therefore, one needs to look into the need for changing the curriculum and internationalize the curriculum within India and in the country. I also mentioned about two pathways of uh, student mobility, especially high cost, high return student mobility and low cost, low return student mobility. These are the two pathways for internationalization that is taking place uh, for stu Indian students. The later part I also introduced what is mentioned in the new education policy in terms of the international branch campuses. This policy makes a change in terms of inviting or encouraging or promoting foreign universities to start branch campuses in India. All these are new changes, dramatic changes to place India on a higher platform in the context of the global role that we play, not only politically and economically, but also the education field. That is where we stand in terms of internationalization of higher education. Thank you.